Hey guys, so in this video, we're gonna take a look at some of the things that you can change on your Unify network to make sure it's configured optimally. Now, this isn't gonna be stuff that necessarily everybody should change, but it is gonna be stuff that I think a lot of users could potentially get some value out of, either from understanding it better or potentially actually making the change to improve either the performance or the reliability of your network. So we're gonna jump right into it. And the first thing we're gonna take a look at is trunk ports as well as ethernet port profiles. So basically when you come in and create a specific VLAN, you have to assign that VLAN to different ports on your actual switches. So this is the Flex 2.5G uh, switch that Ubiquity just announced a few days ago. They sent it to me a few days ago as well. Um, I've used it, really like it. Love the fact that it has eight 2.5 gigabit ports as well as one 10 gigabit RJ45 port as well as one 10 gigabit SFP plus port. And it's really, I think, designed for PoE input. So right now that's how I'm powering the device and it's powering an access point as well, but more devices will be on this. Total side note, just really like it so far. But on these actual ports here, what you will see is that when you specify one of the ports, you're gonna be able to go in and select your VLANs. Now by default, when you select a VLAN, what you're also doing is you're allowing tagged VLAN management. So right below it, you can either allow all traffic, you can block all traffic, or you can select specific VLANs that this port can access. So this is important because what this does, if you select multiple, is it creates a trunk port. And then if you allow a trunk port, what you're allowing is VLAN tagging. So using Proxmox as an example here, I have this virtual machine and in the actual network interface, I specified a tag. And what specifying that tag allows me to do is it allows me to put this device on the surveillance VLAN. So you'll see 220 here, but then you'll see 220 here because that's the VLAN tag that I selected. So by default, this Proxmox node is currently using a trunk port that not only allows the VLAN that it's connected to, but it also allows the surveillance VLAN, which is what allows me to put this specific virtual machine on that VLAN by using its tag. So if I came in here and rather than allowing the traffic, I block the traffic, what I would in essence be doing is saying that you can use the surveillance VLAN using this example, but you can't actually tag any other VLANs. Now that's important to understand because one, you should understand exactly which ports can access what, but two, it's not actually blocking access. It's only blocking VLAN tagging. So let's assume that I wanted the surveillance VLAN to access a device or something. It still can access that device. It just has to access that device through the firewall. So whatever your firewall rules say will ultimately determine the access for this specific device on that network. However, it will not be able to tag that traffic. So that's important to understand because you're not actually blocking traffic to other VLANs. That is determined through your firewall rules. But what you're saying is you're blocking access to tagging other VLANs on this port. So to take it one step further, when you go through and configure all of these different ports, what you're doing is you're individually managing them, which can make it harder if in the future you ever have to tag that traffic. So using the surveillance VLAN here as an example, it's probably not super common that you would do that, but what it does do is it forces you to individually manage all of your ports. So rather than doing that, what you can do is go in and configure an ethernet port profile. So right here, I created this surveillance access port profile, and I basically configured it the exact same way that I configured it in the example before. You can come in here and determine exactly what settings you want, but that's the example. And now if I go back to that switch and I select a port, rather than going in and modifying the settings here, if you select manual, you can come down here and select ethernet port profile, and then you can select the port profile that you created. So at that point, this all is disabled, but what you're in essence saying is that rather than individually managing these ports that are all the same, and if I ever have to update them, going back and updating them individually, this allows you to manage them on a global level. So I try and use port profiles where I can, but I set this up so that you could see exactly how it works. So in terms of the actual port profile, you don't have to use the port profile. What's more important is that you configure these options up here but you should know what ports do and do not have access to actually tag other VLANs because this stops something called VLAN hopping. So for security, it's important because what you're not allowing is you're not allowing that device to tag other VLANs and potentially hop to that VLAN. 
Not the most likely problem that you'll run into, but this technically stops it, so why wouldn't you implement it? Now, the next one is going to be not fully understanding return traffic. Now, I just went over this in my Unify zone-based firewall video, but it bears repeating because it's super important to understand. When you come in and create a basic firewall rule, and I'm gonna show this the old way and the new way, I'm gonna bounce back and forth here, but generally when you create a firewall rule, you set the advanced option here to be auto. So to simplify this rule, what we're saying is that the IoT network should not be able to access the trusted network. That's what this rule would say. However, if you keep auto enabled, what you're actually doing is you're blocking all traffic. So what that means is that you're blocking traffic in both directions. So what you would think is that you're only blocking traffic from the IoT network to the trusted network because that's what the rule says. But what you're actually doing is you're not only blocking traffic from the IoT network to the trusted network, but you're blocking access from the trusted network to the IoT network. And the reason for that is because when you actually initiate a connection from the trusted network, the IoT network has to be able to reply to that traffic. If you don't allow that reply traffic, it will be blocked. So the way that you get around that in the old interface is you come in here and you select manual, but you uncheck established and related. And then at this point, what this rule is saying is that if the IoT network attempts to access the trusted network, it will be blocked because that connection state is new. However, if the trusted network tries to access the IoT network, the IoT network can respond to that traffic because at that point it's established or related traffic. So this firewall rule in its current state will allow the trusted VLAN to access the IoT VLAN, assuming there aren't any other firewall rules, when if you don't configure it this way, it won't be able to. Now, with the zone-based firewall, it's a little different, and it's a little different because here in the actual connection state, there's an option for return traffic. So this is just an easier way for you to understand exactly how the return traffic works, and I love the fact that they did this. But this is important to understand for one pretty commonly used option. So when you go in and create a new VLAN, there is this isolate network option that you can select. And when you select it, what it's ultimately doing is it's creating a firewall rule on your behalf. And when it creates that firewall rule, what you'll see is in the connection state, it blocks everything. So when you isolate a network, what you're saying is that that network can't connect to anything, but nothing can connect to that network as well. So if you actually wanted to use that isolate network feature, rather than coming in here and creating a custom connection state, the same way that you would in the old interface here, it's the same way in the new interface, you can use the isolate network feature. However, what you would have to do is you'd have to come in here and select the actual IoT VLAN and then select a zone and select either any of the other VLANs in that zone or a specific network in that zone. And what you'd have to do is you would have to allow traffic back. So rather than blocking it, you would allow it. And what you're saying is the IoT VLAN can reply to any other internal zone VLAN only if the connection state is for return traffic. And then when you isolate the network, what you're stating is that, yes, the IoT VLAN can't actually access anything else, but anything that's trying to access the IoT VLAN will be able to actually access it. So super powerful, a little easier to understand with the new layout. If you don't know how this works, I have a video, I'll leave a pop-up for that now, but super powerful in understanding exactly what that return traffic means. So the next one is not setting static IP addresses on your actual physical hardware. Now, this is important for one main reason, and the main reason is DNS. There's a joke in the IT world that it's always DNS. DNS is always at fault. And the reason for that is because that's what IT people come across all the time. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to get ahead of that. So if you come into any of these devices and you go to the gear icon, every single time I set up any hardware, I come in and set up a static IP address for it. I'm not doing it for the IP address. That helps, it's never a bad thing to do that. I'm doing it for the DNS server. So as you build your home lab or your small business network or whatever you're actually using right now, as you build it, there's gonna come a day potentially where you wanna implement a DNS server or you wanna do something with DNS. And that can lead to problems. So what you're doing with this 
is you're basically stating that at any time you can change your DNS settings, you can modify anything, but the physical hardware should never use those DNS servers. We just want to select two different vendors. So this is Cloudflare, 1.1.1.1 is Cloudflare, 8.8.8.8 is Google. You could use whoever you want, but I set it this way so that I know I have two different vendors and my physical hardware will absolutely never use the DNS servers that I set for my DHCP leases. And at that point, if I ever screw up DNS internally, it's not actually impacting any of these devices. There are some examples online of people running into problems by not setting it up this way. And I think it's a general recommendation to do this, but I don't know how common it is. So the next one is going to be not using link aggregation. And this is really going to be dependent on the actual hardware you have. So here I have the USW Pro HD 24 PoE that Ubiquiti sent me as well. I've been using this for a few weeks. Same thing. Love it. I'm actually trying to replace this Pro Max 24 PoE with this Pro HD 24 PoE because to me, it's just a better switch, meaning that it has 22, two and a half gigabit ports, two 10 gigabit RJ45 ports, and then four 10 gigabit SFP plus ports. So for the majority of people, depending on exactly what you're looking for, this might be the only switch you need. I've really liked it and I'm slowly migrating everything to it. But back on track here, link aggregation. The reason why link aggregation is important, and again, it depends on your physical hardware. The reason why it's important though, is because what you're doing is with link aggregation, you're configuring two lanes for the traffic to actually come and go from. So using this switch as an example, there's 22 two and a half gigabit ports. Let's assume that five of these two and a half gigabit ports were fully saturating themselves, totally nonsense scenario, but let's assume they were, and they were all trying to access a device that is not on this specific switch here. What would happen if you didn't configure link aggregation is that you would be bottlenecked by the one 10 gigabit link. So there's five total two and a half gigabit ports, which equals 12 and a half gigabits of total throughput that it's trying to use, but it can only utilize one 10 gigabit connection. So the way that you fix that is that you configure something called link aggregation. And this switch right now is configured with link aggregation. So how I have it set up is it's currently aggregating ports 27 and 28, which are these two ports here. They have to be sequential. It's aggregating those ports with a aggregation switch that I have. And then basically at that point, what we're saying is there's 20 total gigabits of throughput. It can utilize either of these, which then in the example that I gave would allow that full 12 and a half gigabits of throughput to actually leave the switch at full speed. Now, not only does it provide that, but it provides link redundancy. So if anything was to happen to the cable or the port on either of the switches, the connection won't go down. So it's active and backup plus it actually allows for double the throughput. So rather than 10 gigabits of throughput, it will allow for 20 gigabits of throughput. Now you can do this in various ways. And what you'll see is right now I have this 16 port switch aggregating ports 15 and 16, which are two and a half gigabit ports to the Pro Max 24 PoE that I have. So for this switch, rather than having two and a half gigabits of throughput, I have five gigabits of throughput and it's using two, two and a half gigabit ports for that. Now, one day I'll hopefully have a fiber cable out there, but at this point it's not looking good. So the next thing is pretty basic, but it's very, very important for VPNs. So when you configure a VPN server, the benefit of using Unify hardware is that it's super user friendly. However, that user friendliness sometimes can bite you if you just take for granted all these default settings. So the majority of users have a dynamic external IP address. And what that means is that periodically it will change. You might go years with it never changing, but periodically it will change, especially if you unplug it and plug it back in. When you configure a VPN, what it's actually doing is in that actual configuration file that it creates, it's specifying the IP address as a static IP address. So using WireGuard as an example, when you actually go through and export one of the certificates, this right here, which you won't see, will be the external IP address of my home. So what you really wanna do is use dynamic DNS. And that ensures that if the actual IP address ever changes, at that point, it will utilize the DDNS host name instead, which will then be updated with that new external IP address and you won't lose connection. So you can configure DDNS on your actual Unify router, 
But what you want to do is after you configure DDNS, you'd come in here and then you'd specify whatever that DDNS host name is. And then when you go and export the configuration, it will use that as opposed to using the IP address. And the way you can create uh, dynamic DNS is in the actual internet section, select your primary WAN, and then you can create a new dynamic DNS service. And you can use any of these services. And then you have to go basically create an account on there, come in here, specify that account, and then you would use that DDNS host name in the VPN section. But this is powerful for just about everything. So those are five things that I think everybody can get some value out of, hopefully. Um, not everything is something that you're gonna use or implement, but it is something that I hope you could at least understand either better or for the future if you wanna go through and actually implement any of it. So if you made it this far, thank you very much for watching. I will see you guys next time.